Okay, I'd like to get started with our next speaker. Thank you all for attending. Our next speaker is Ms. Jenna Linder from the Department of Art. The title of her presentation is Where's the Line Drawn? Jenna. Thank you. Okay, today I'm going to be talking about the difference between vandalism and art. The vandalism of art for religious, political, or personal reasons has occurred since the time of the Persian Wars in ancient Greece. Most of the time, these defacements are considered illegal, the person is arrested, and the artwork is restored. But what if the person who defaced the piece is an artist? What if the person claims that what took place was an artistic act, a reinvention of an old piece into an entirely new piece? Today's presentation focuses on Vladimir Umanek, who widely known as Vladimir Umanets, who was caught in October of 2012 defacing a Mark Rothko painting hanging in the Tate Modern in London. I will contextualize this event by comparing it and the response it generated to actual events of vandalism on canonical art, artwork, sorry, <clears throat> graffiti, the legacy of Marcel Duchamp and his impact on the contemporary art community, the artistic pr practices of Robert Rauschenberg, Ai Weiwei and the Chapman brothers, and current debates about artistic value. Through this contextualization, I will wrestle with the question, when does when it comes to vandalism and art, where is the line drawn? It is my conclusion that the acts of Vladimir Unimets were vandalism in a vain attempt to gain recognition he was not getting but felt he was due. Vladimir Umanets was born Vladimir sorry Udimir, I don't know how to pronounce his name, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, he was a Polish national of Worthing, West Sussex, in the UK, but residing in Russia during the time of the defacement. During visiting hours at the Tate Modern, October 7, 2012, he wrote a Mark Rothko's Black on Maroon with a graffiti marker, the statement, Vladimir Umanets, 2012, a potential piece of yellowism. Before turning to the motivations for this act and the meaning of this statement, it is important to consider Rothko's place in contemporary art and what his paintings signify. Rothko was a central member of the New York School or Extra Abstract Expressionism movement that came to prominence in the period from 1945 to 1960. Critics like Clement Greenberg and subsequent generations of curators and art historians have characterized this approach to painting as highly individualistic and representative of the personal and artistic freedoms enjoyed by American artists in direct contrast to the repression experience experienced artists in the so Soviet Union and former Eastern Bloc of countries like Poland. Rothko's paintings specifically speak to both formalist explorations of color and pictorial space and the art artist's interest in spiritual transcendence. Black on Maroon is one of the three mural-sized canvases painted for the Four Seasons restaurant in New York that were never installed, reportedly because Rothko did not want them to be the background for the eating of the privileged. The artist gave the paintings to the Tate Gallery in 1969, shortly before his suicide in 1970. Following his death, the price of Rothko's artwork rose dramatically, and today Black on Maroon is estimated to be worth eight to $14 million. Seeping through several la layers of paint, the graffiti marker used by Umanets on the bottom right corner of the painting created damage that could cost up to $318,000 to repair. Umnitz issued several statements after the defacing explaining his concept of yellowism. It was an artistic statement, but it was more about having the opportunity to speak about galleries and art, which it certainly did. I will now play a short clip of, yellowism, of the yellowist exhibition to give you an idea of what yellowism art looks like. If it all work, maybe I won't do that. Oh, I won't do that since it won't work. Okay, anyways, um, his actions created a lot of I don't know what's happening. Well, I'll just continue, sorry. 
Okay. Um, his actions created a lot of discussion about his art movement and yellowism, which he describes as neither art nor anti-art, and the context for art, for works of art, is already art. Yellowism is described as not necessarily about yellow, yet every piece of work involves yellow, whether visible or not. Every piece is described as identical in expressions, meaning, and execution, with any interpretations are flattened to yellow. All of this described in Umanet's manifesto, a long-standing tradition of the avant-garde art movement such as Dada, Fluxus, and the Situationist International. Manifestos are used by artists to declare their main purpose within their art, allowing the public to understand their overall theme and core beliefs in their body of work. These movements in the past involved strong beliefs of a group of artists who changed the course of the art world with groundbreaking ideas still used and taught in schools today. Umanet's manifesto seems to go in circles and his main idea is unclear to those reading it. However, it is clear by creating such a statement, he was trying to align himself with the influential artists of the past. In the Yellowest Manifesto, Umanet declares his art as neither art nor anti-art. The debate between the two ideas is one that began in the early, early 20th century, beginning with the Dada movement in the early 1900s. Marcel Duchamp really emphasized the idea of anti-art in his work. I don't know what's happening. Um, these pieces are, should I like turn the volume off on here? I don't know. I don't know. Yes, thank you. We have an expert. Okay, because yeah, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> That's okay. Thanks. Okay, anyway, sorry about that. Okay. Anti-art includes pieces such as ready-mades, which Marcel Duchamp was known for. These pieces are objects such as a bottle rack, bike tires, etc., put into a gallery setting as art. Duchamp used his ready-mades to show the viewer a new context to a, fall, a familiar object. Often he would add a spotlight and play with shadows, making the shadow the main focus of the piece. Anti-art was a movement against traditional Western art, usually paintings from a still life model or nature with a specific meaning and purpose. As with the case of manifestos, Umanets would have been familiar with the debate of art versus anti-art and most likely use this knowledge in his own manifesto to create a link between himself and the influential artists of modern art. Shortly after his arrest, Umanitz declared that Marcel Duchamp, the early 20th century artist whose own work stretched boundaries and ideas never seen before, would be proud of his work, stating, I don't want to be considered a vandal or someone who wants to destroy something, especially such a valuable painting. It's more about to change the perception of things, of spectators. I'm not saying I'm another Marcel Duchamp. I'm not a tag maker. I'm doing my own thing. I definitely believe that Marcel Duchamp would be really happy. Marcel Duchamp worked in New York City. He was made famous. Sorry, I'm going to go back to the Marcel Duchamp slide. I'm really sorry. Okay. Marcel Duchamp worked in New York City. He was made famous when he put a urinal in a gallery setting and it was accepted as art. This started his work with ready Maids, changing the context of objects and allowing viewers to see them as something entirely different. These ideas were entirely new at the time and changed the way artists view their means of execution and subject matter. One Duchamp piece that would have particularly influenced to Umanets was Look. With this ready made, Duchamp took a copy of Da Vinci's Mona Lisa and drew a mustache and a beard on her face with the title Look. Pronounced look underneath, L-O-H-O-Q, pronounced look underneath it. With this title, Duchamp would have been telling the artist to look at the Mona Lisa again, a piece so famous that her face is ingrained in everyone's memory and therefore may not actually see her anymore. The French term L-H-O-O-Q is also a pun, forming the sentence l a t r o d o c i l or she has a hot ass, making the viewer to take 
to think about a part of the Mona Lisa you cannot see in sexualizing the female, which he then masculated with his doodles, creating questions of sexuality at a time when these things were not open to discussion. Look is still taught in schools today and as a groundbreaking piece of work, and surely would have had a role on Umanet's decision to deface the Rothko painting. While the focus of discussion after the Tate deface, defacing seemed to be security and a rising curiosity about yellowism, there seems to be a point that everyone had looked over. In the past, there have been several art artists who have taken work that was not their own and defaced it in a way and went on to display these, the piece as their own work. The question that should be raised by this current situation is what separates art and vandalism? Is it simply as simple as ownership or permission? Or is art that hangs in a gallery for all to see considered public? After all, art is for everyone, correct? Neo-Dadaist artist Robert Rauschenberg held ideas similar to his predecessor Marcel Duchamp in that he believed in working in the gap between life and art and questions, questioned what separated art objects from everyday objects. In 1953, Rauschenberg contacted William de Kooning and requested a drawing from the artist with the sole purpose of erasing it. Choosing de Kooning was not a random draw. He was considered a master even in his own time. His raw, brushy paintings of women, done in an abstract, almost frightening style, shocked and intrigued critics, putting him at the top of the modern art world. Rauschenberg admired and understood de Kooning. He respected his work and looked up, to his, uh, looked up to him as a mentor. Choosing to erase a piece of his work was an act Rauschenberg felt necessary to move, move his own art forward. He saw it as erasing the old, a father figure of the abstract expressionism movement and moving into uncharted territory. Rauschenberg did not only view this as a transitional movement in art, but also an odd compliment to de Kooning, who, who also understood the purpose of Rauschenberg's idea. De Kooning ag agreed, but would not make it easy on Rauschenberg, and chose materials that were very difficult to erase. After a month of erasing, and f 40 erasers later, the drawing was completely gone, and a new piece by Rauschenberg was created, which he called Erase de Kooning. A now famous piece of work, Umnitz as an artist would have been familiar with this story, the idea of a younger artist, a younger newer artist representing the new generation, erasing and moving forward from the older generation of artists would have appealed to him to a man trying to get his own movement noticed. Umnitz may have viewed himself like a Rauschenberg figure, seeing his defacing his erasing Rothko, a master, and moving forward with yellowism. I think it is a good time now to discuss graffiti and street art. Very recently, street art has become popular in the contemporary <laughs> art community. I think it is important to stress, to stress the difference between street art and graffiti, such as tagging. Street artists, such as Banksy or Jean-Michel Basquiat, use the sides of buildings and billboards, sorry, billboards as a canvas for images that contain meaning and content, as with all art. Graffiti and tagging are almost always just works and, of symbols and little images, most often associated with gangs to mark a territory or vandalize a building. <coughs> this point is relevant to the Tate defacing, as what Umanitz has done is tag the Rothko painting. He did not create an image, nor did he make a political, philosophical, or meaningful statement. He simply tagged the painting with his name. Making art as a matter of is a matter of taking ideas and beliefs and turning them into something physical and aesthetic. Presently, most ideas have been done before, so young artists are left with the task of taking their own ideas of artists they find influential and making them their own. They recycle art in a way. After looking at some of the masters of the past, I will now take a look at more contemporary artists who share the same ideas and those who preceded them. A more contemporary version of Marcel Duchamp exists in the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei, whose interest in disestablishing the meaning and value connected with cultural artifact, artifacts has led to some shocking pieces. In the early 90s, Weiwei and his brother Ai, Ai Chan began searching for ancient Chinese ceramics in the antique markets of Beijing. Interested in the ideas of the ready-mades and wanting to make a statement on the ramifications of mass production throughout Chinese history, Weiwei created a series of vases in which he painted the Coca-Cola logo on. 
Han Dynasty urn with Coca-Cola Coca logo, which is C, in later series where he dropped and therefore shattering an urn in 1995. In 2005, Weiwei went back to painting vases in a piece colored vases where he used industrial paint to cover 51 Neolithic vases in various <coughs> colors. These acts would and maybe should be shocking to the public. The first to do anything like this, Ai Weiwei is destroying pieces of history through his art as some of these urns and vases are from 5000 BCE. The question of ownership may seem to be more clear in this case as he bought the Neolithic pots himself. But as a great pieces of art and history, should these pots technically belong to the Chinese public or government? Furthermore, by destroying them, is Ai Weiwei depriving further generations access to their culture's history through art? Why is there more of a public outcry for a little graffiti than there is for plain destruction of history? This is not an argument of whether Ai Weiwei is wrong, as his message is one I can see as valid as intriguing. The issue is this to the seemingly pick-and-choose attitude of the public on what is considered defacement in art. In relevance to Umanit's defacement, I think it can be argued that there is no outcry against Weiwei since he bought the pots. Not only were the pots his property, but they are something of abundance in China. Using that with his political statement, it is easier for the public to accept his actions. Umanit might have seen this and with the ideas of previous artists discussed, use this influence and ju to justify his ideas to deface the Rothko, claiming it as a statement on the gallery piece. The difference between Ai Weiwei and Umanitz could simply be the fact that Weiwei owned those pots, but without the effectiveness of his political and artistic statements and the abundance of the pots, Weiwei's work would not be more widely accepted. Umanitz defaced a one-of-a-kind Rothko painting with the idea so obscure no one had heard of it until after the fact. Had his act been more clearly defined, maybe it would have been more respected rather than viewed as a cry for attention. Perhaps the most influential and last example of defacement in art, in art are the acts of the Chapman brothers, a duo known for their controversial, appalling, and vulgar subject matter. However, in 2003, the Chapman brothers, Dinos and Jake, created an uproar in the art community when they bought Goya's Disaster of War, a set totaling 80 etches altogether, and defaced all of them by changing the visible heads to clowns, clown heads and puppy heads. Then they took the etchings and exhibit, exhibited them in, at the Modern Art in Oxford as a series called The Rape of Creativity. Although this is very similar to what Rauschenberg did, the Chapman brothers have received a ton of backlash from the public, claiming they ruined a masterpiece. This could be due to the fact that at the time Rauschenberg made a race to Kooning, he was not widely known. The Chapman brothers have already made a name for themselves by the time they created Rape of Creativity. Goyle is also a beloved artist to those in the art world, considered a master in his own right to the public, <clears throat> to the public who viewed the young brothers as delinquents. It may be that the decades from that decades from now they will be seen with the same affection as Rauschenberg, but for now they are still somewhat the villains. Their work would have been known to Umanitz and perhaps influenced his decision making and also defacing a famous work. However, with Ai Wei, as with Ai Weiwei, the Chapman brothers owned the Goya prints and Umanitz defaced a public piece of property, not strictly his own. As any artist or student can tell you, it has all been done before. To make art now, an artist must take the influence of others' work and make them their own. As an artist, Umnitz understood this fact, but rather than working hard to achieve his own vision of work he found influential, he took the easy way out. Perhaps he thought he deserved recognition and turned to the artists he admired and followed their footsteps. But in that process, he brought down a master. He cheated, he took something that was not his own and put a tag on it. No one can say if yellowism would have been more successful had he owned the work he defaced, but it is clear it would have been more respected. Thank you.